A very warm hello. We had the union budget five days ago and now is the time to get a ringside view of the proposals announced by Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman. Was it an industry-friendly budget or was it a middle-class budget? And did it prove to be a pre-election budget? This episode will answer many of those questions and more. I'm Nivedita Mukherjee and welcome to the concluding episode of Budget with BS, a very special show brought to you by Business Standard. Hello, I am Ruchika Chitravanshi. It has been an exciting journey for us while we sliced and diced many important issues in the run-up to the budget. And here we are for the grand finale of our show. We have a collection of views to explain the many shades of the budget. Ruchika, what do we start with? Uh, let us begin with the policy makers who have been at the forefront of uh, the union budget 2023-24. Here's what Finance Secretary T.V. Somanathan has to say in his interaction with Arup Roy Chaudhary. You are again giving that support to states. However, we have seen based on this year's data, the first eight months or April to November, the most of the states, at least the 10 biggest states that we have done that analysis, have not been able to spend capex as much as last year, either in absolute terms or as percentage. Not most, tax. I would say some. Some so have the, actually the, almost substantially increased their capex. So Urissa, the, Gujarat, hmm. Uttar Pradesh, Gujarat has Bihar. Increased. Uttar Pradesh, Bihar. Also. But not as a percentage of their capex targets. In absolute terms, they have. That's, State government's capex target is not a relevant factor to be looked at at all. You should look at year-on-year -year comparison. Is it a problem with capacity? I mean, they have not been able to ramp no, up no. capacity. I as think much the right the number to look at in capex for it's a absolute term is always year-on-year -year comparison. Absolutely. That is valid. Right. In the in that respect, Gujarat, Uttar Pradesh, Karnataka, Uttar, Karnataka, hmm. Bihar hmm. have all raised their capex. All right. All right. So, and you are confident that will? I also expect even the laggard states, hmm. the last quarter will show some uptick. Because that right. is traditionally the time in which states do the capital expenditure. The whole sort of narrative now, sort of, is that you are, okay, you have given SOPs to the middle class, but also cutting taxes of the rich. Yeah, see, the there are there is an aspect to be looked at here, hmm. that our maximum marginal tax rate was considered, above 40, hmm. is generally considered to be high. One of the highest in the world. One of the highest in the world. And this is a deterrent to some of our entrepreneurs who have choices of location to mm -hmm. locate in India. So if you're a startup, mm -hmm. you can locate in India and work from here or you can locate in Dubai or Singapore, which are tax havens mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. So the obviously we are not going to compete with Dubai and mm -hmm. Singapore on tax haven status. Mm -hmm. But we also don't want to be one of the highest in the world. Mm -hmm. So, the maximum marginal rate has been brought down. Mm. We think this will have good effects in terms of investment, India as an investment destination. Mm. But at the same time, we are closing a number of loopholes exploited predominantly yes. by the yeah. highest level of taxpayer, mm. which is market linked debentures, mm. high value insurance, mm. exemptions from capital gains by investment in real estate, mm -hmm. and some of the travel and things which go on without commensurate payment of taxes. So there are a number of measures here which actually are directed at collecting the fair share from the higher income individuals, but not imposing a high marginal rate of tax on them at 42.7. Some cities have still had some success in municipal bonds, but mostly in India, municipal bond market is really not picked up in spite of repeated attempts. And FM had spoken about it in the budget yesterday. So how do you want to expect the center and the states to incentivize? Bonds? There are a number of measures that Department of Economic Affairs takes and Niti Aayog takes, which is in the form of, you know, advice, persuasion, uh, technical assistance. Mm. In addition, in mm. this year's state capital mm. investment mm. loans, mm. the 50-year loan, mm. a component will be linked to progress on mm. issuance of municipal bonds. So, if mm. a municipality is able to issue it, we will provide them some financial support, okay. which will basically make the bonds cheaper for them mm. in some way. Mm. It may be direct, it may be indirect, but mm. there will be money available for getting yourself into the municipal bond market 
either completely or by completing the prerequisites. So by when can we expect the guidelines to come for this? The a draft, so there are two schemes there. Mm-hmm. One is for refund of forfeited earnest money and forfeited performance security. That is expected shortly. Mm-hmm. The guidelines will be out very shortly. Mm-hmm. For the shortly meaning in within weeks, mm-hmm. if not sooner. Mm-hmm. For the uh, the scheme on arbitral and other mm-hmm. awards and disputes, a draft scheme will first be published. We will invite comments mm-hmm. and then notify. Okay. The draft scheme, again, we expect to come out shortly. Within so, this covers pending payments? This covers... Uh, this covers basically disputes. Whether disputes. The contractor and the government have a dispute. Okay. It has and gone into arbitration. The arbitration out. award has been given, mm-hmm. but the uh, government has gone in appeal or the other party has gone in appeal mm-hmm. or there are counterclaims. So, there are a number of these, particularly in the infrastructure sector. How many such cases are there? Would the would They are in hundreds, definitely, if not in thousands. I am aware they are at least in hundreds. And how many of them they are? They are of high value because they are principally mm. in infrastructure. Yeah. So, any amount in mind? I would not want to hazard one. I have some figures for one or two agencies, mm. but I would not want to share Okay, understood, understood. Finance Secretary T.V. Somanathan is quite candid, like always, on the thinking behind the budget. He points at three pillars to keep the growth rate up, to maintain macroeconomic stability, and to take care of a large majority of the population. Ruchika, what do you think about the animal spirit of uh, India Inc? Well, without actually mentioning animal spirits, Mr. Somnathan points out that this is a good time for the industry to invest. Moving on to the next big interview, we have Economic Affairs Secretary Ajay Seth speaking to Arup Roy Chaudhary and Asit Ranjan Mishra. What has been the thinking and the main drivers behind this latest budget by the finance minister and her team including you? What has been the thinking behind that? I'll put it uh, three elements. One, that we should continue to support growth uh, in the context of that we had in the year of the pandemic, uh, we had uh, the loss of output. We have to make up for that. So we need to grow faster and we have to grow for a long number of years. So there is a strong impetus to grow. The second, it has to be done in a manner that we are physically prudent, especially in the context of very high degree of uncertainty at the we don't go overboard to compromise in any way the fiscal balance and what it takes to provide a very strong strength for the macroeconomic parameters. That was the second element. Third one, don't keep our eyes off what is needed for the long term, the potential of the economy in terms of its productive capacity, its potential for getting skills to the people so that they are ready when the when the job opportunities as they are growing up, the right set of skills are available for them. And third one is keep our eyes very clearly on the productivity aspect. So these are the three broad areas, uh, growth, fiscal prudence and the long-term investment of the softer aspects of the economy like the skilling and the other productivity. So a lot of the attention obviously has been on capex. In key consecutive years, the government has raised year on year capex by more than 30 percent, 35 percent, 34 percent, 35 percent, not 33 percent. Um, so number one, how do you measure the efficacy of that capex on the ground, the center's capex? Uh, secondly, the belief before the budget was that private sector capex is finally coming back. And while the center may have to increase capex, it may not be as much as previous years, but in fact, it is as much as previous years. So what has been the thinking? Are you still believing that private sector capex is not pulling its weight? In spite of whatever recovery private sector balance sheets have shown, private sector capex is not as much as where you would like it to be. I request you to uh, look at it in a more nuanced manner. Hmm. Where government capex is going and where the private ca- capex is expected to come is happening. Government capex, a very dominant part, is taken to railways, roads, urban infrastructure. Mm. These are the sectors that 90% plus of the investment anyway is happening because of the 
public investment, mm. not because of private investment. True. And those are the investments are needed whether we do it today mm. or we do it over a number of years. Mm. Private investment when we are talking about, mm. these are in the sectors of the infrastructure wherein uh, private investments are significant, for example, in telecom, mm. ports, airports and so on, there are a couple of others, or in plant and machinery, mm. or in a large scale uh, housing projects. Mm. So those are the ones, these are two different ones, but these are complementing each other. Budget obviously assumes uh, nominal GDP growth rate of 10.5%. So what is the real GDP growth rate you have uh, implicit day assumed? Here you are talking about, see that when you talk about a nominal growth rate, uh, this is a combination as we are well aware of the uh, deflator as well as for the real growth rate. Economic survey uh, puts a number that range being 6 to 6.8 hmm. with probability or our assessment being that towards the higher level rather than at the lower level and we share that view while making the budget not saying we but the economic survey is very much part, of the, part of the finance ministry. Hmm. Our sense is that yes it will be 6.5% plus that leaves another 4% uh, in terms of the deflator uh, coming in. And if you look at uh, that WPI is cooling down, uh, at the same time inflation, uh, CPI inflation uh, is again 5.5, I'll put a broad number uh, moving forward. But if you were to see, uh, if the inflation were to go down further, that's one, that will also need to add to the growth. So, so it is the interplay for us to separate 10.5 uh, is, a, is a difficult task. So it can play out with different numbers. So that we'll definitely see, while we have not decided the amount, we will definitely see green bond um, issuances next year, next financial year. So that decision has to be taken when we decide the calendar for the H2 of 23. H1, we are ruling it. H1, we do not plan because the money which have been raised, and I clarified that aspect, that having raised money in the month of January and February, uh, in terms of a compact with those investors, mm -hmm. an unwritten compact is what to say, that monies will be moved after the monies are raised. Yes, yes, we yes. can't say that I have used it for the previous expenditure on those projects. Okay. When we yeah. use it, we are, we are getting 8,000 crores has been subscribed, other 8,000 will come in mm -hmm. uh, in the coming week. So that has to be now onwards and we say that would suffice certainly for over the next 6 to 9 months. Economic Affairs Secretary Ajay said sums up the theme of the budget in three bullet points, growth, fiscal prudence, and job opportunities. That's quite in sync with what the finance secretary highlights, isn't it, Ruchika? Yes, absolutely, Nivedita. Now we go over to someone who is a former bureaucrat and who was part of the core budget-making team till recently, former Revenue and Department of Economic Affairs Secretary Tarun Bajaj also had a long stint in the Prime Minister's office. Mr. Bajaj speaks to Shrimi Chaudhary. You've been the integral part of uh, the government in the first 10 months uh, of the current financial year. How are you seeing this budget and uh, is there any hit or misses? What's the take on overall uh, you know, outcome? So I think it's a very good budget. And uh, the FM has tried to balance the fiscal prudence on the one hand and also taken care of growth while taking care of all sections of the society. So I think it's a balanced budget and uh, I don't think anybody can say that it's a popular budget in the sense that it is catering to the electoral politics. So that's a very good thing in this budget which I feel. The FM deserves a praise for. Everybody is saying that, you know, being uh, being the last full budget before election, government tried to sort of balance it out. Uh, you think the tax soaps which has been announced, especially the <coughs> tweaking in the personal income tax regime has been done to sort of, uh, you know, just to see, uh, you know, people reaction and, and to make things in a way uh, that give uh, some sort of message that it's a populist budget? I don't think so. That's a fair comment to make on the tweaking on the personal income tax. If you recall, there has been a long debate in the media and it actually reached a crescendo just before the budget where everybody was asking why people are not shifting to the new regime and why uh, the new regime is not getting the traction that the government had actually wished for. 
So there were some arbitrages between the new regime and the old regime and this particular step which is a very bold step on revenues front I would say has tried to address that and you will notice that a large number of people will get a relief they will move to the new tax regime but one cannot say that this is something like a tax swap for an election it is actually a very pragmatic and a very sensible uh, step uh, that was waiting to be taken so fm during uh, in fact the post budget speech said that nobody being forced to shift to the new it regime uh, do you have a different view so right now what the government is saying that they will give an option of you to remain in the old regime or come into the new regime the default regime is the new regime which i understand that once you go to the portal you will be fixed in the new regime unless you choose the old regime uh, so nobody is being forced but point is that if i have to pay less tax in the new regime than what i am paying in the old tax regime i'll automatically come into the new tax regime and i personally feel that a majority of the taxpayers population will come into the new regime of course speaking on the numbers sir i wanted to ask you specifically that you know government this time has taken same growth in tax collection as gdp so won't there be any buoyancy due to higher gdp and in case yes tax collection may grow higher than budgeted na so i'll say if you say that they have taken a tax buoyancy of 1 they have also taken a tax buoyancy of 1 because of the external headwinds that are Uh, on the way so if the uh, west especially europe is facing some kind of a recession and america also the growth rate is lower so it will definitely impact the indian industry also so to that keeping that into view it's better to be cautious and to err on the caution rather than repent later say if the buoyancy instead of 1 comes out to 1.2 So one point two would give you another uh, maybe sixty thousand crores if thirty lakh crores is the uh, GDP. So sixty thousand crores is something which either will get absorbed in the uh, demand for grants for various ministries, or if something is left out, the economists can be made happy if the fiscal deficit goes down even lower than five point nine to say five point eight or something like that, and that's a pathway to the Uh, fiscal consolidation as we can see sir the lot of global uh, uh, you know headwinds are coming and uh, there are fears of having a global recession you think india is prepared uh, for that and um, of course a budget has come out with a road map but overall if you could uh, tell us that uh, uh, you see see any effect uh, uh, this these factors would affect uh, the country uh, you know overall So the first thing that I like to say in the current year also our growth rate is going to be one of the highest in the major economies. So in spite of the global headwinds that are coming in from all directions we have been able to do a good job and I see no reason why this would not continue in the coming year also especially that the government in has given a very balanced budget and the emphasis is again on capex and also not only capex but the quality of expenditure that is there that the large part of the fiscal deficit or the borrowing will be used for capital expenditure rather than revenue expenditure as a percentage revenue expenditure is also coming <clears throat> down so i think while there are some certain risks that are there but i think with a 10.5 estimate of the gdp which is lower than what uh, is there for the current year i think we should be home and uh, again we should be able to do far better than the other countries and even if there are some uh, issues as was uh, mentioned by one of the secretaries in the press conference yesterday there's enough cushion both on the expenditure and revenue side to take care of those exigencies and if there's a need for more expenditure in a particular area i think the government will be able to manage that former revenue and department of economic affairs secretary tarun bajaj calls it a very balanced budget his interview also captures the general sense that this budget has something for all sections of the society but he thinks it's not a populist budget ruchika did you see the rating that he gave to the budget on tv channel yes yes very very generous 
anyway, now we go over to an eminent economist who was a key member of the 1991 Reform Dream Team. Former Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission, Montek Singh Ahluwalia has held many top positions, including Special Secretary in the Prime Minister's Office, Finance Secretary, Economic Affairs Secretary and Commerce Secretary through the years. Mr. Aluwalia shares his post-budget thoughts with Arup Roy Chaudhary. Thank you for taking your time out and speaking with Business Standard. What would be your three or four biggest takeaways from the Honorable Finance Minister's uh, Union Budget speech this time, sir? What stood out for you? That's a good question because, you know, at budget time, usually everything is discussed. Hmm. And the budget speech also refers to many, many initiatives. Hmm. But it's important to sit back and look at one of the big messages. Hmm. Now, as I see it, perhaps the most important message in the budget is that uh, she hmm. is starting the return to fiscal consolidation. Hmm. Uh, the fiscal deficit for the current year, which ends uh, in another month or so, uh, has been kept at whatever was budgeted, 6.4%, which is fine. The important thing is in the coming year, the fiscal deficit is being reduced uh, from 6.4 to 5.9. In other words, a half a percentage point of GDP correction in the fiscal deficit. And in that sense, therefore, the fiscal deficit in the coming year is less expansionary than it was in the year that's about to end. I think that's the right thing to do because frankly, many, like many countries during the pandemic, we had a big increase in our fiscal deficit. And you know, India's fiscal deficit was much above that of other developing countries. So it was necessary to give the, uh, uh, give the signal that we are getting back to normal. That's good. <clears throat> Second, and this I think is in many ways even more important. She hasn't just stopped at what the fiscal deficit is going to be next year. She's also indicated that in the next two years, that is 24, 25, 25, 26, uh, she hopes to bring the fiscal deficit down further so that by the year 25, 26, she has said that it will go below 4.5%. Now that requires a minimum correction in the next two years or something of the order of about 1.4% of GDP or 0.7% of GDP each year. That is actually going to be tough. Uh, and I think it's the right signal how it's going to be achieved this for the future. But at least uh, the government is putting itself in a position where investors, analysts, etc., will judge performance by whether this objective is going to be achieved. And I think that's an important uh, second uh, component. The third, which I thought was important, is that, you know, within an overall fiscal position, which is less expansionary than it was in the current year, uh, there's a big increase in capital expenditure. Now, remember, uh, as far as the overall fiscal deficit is concerned, the, the impact or the stimulus is really measured by the size of the deficit. Mm. In that sense, next year, uh, the fiscal stimulus is less than this year. Mm. But within that less, on the expenditure side, there's a big increase in capital expenditure. <coughs> now, <coughs> one can imagine that many people would say that perhaps you should have increased expenditure in certain areas more than other areas. I mean, there's always benefits of doing one or the other. There's a lot of research which shows that the, if you like, the expansionary impact of expenditure on infrastructure is greater than the expansionary impact of other expenditure. So from that point of view, a somewhat smaller fiscal deficit, bigger increase in capital expenditure, I think is a right message to have. Now, within this, you need to look at uh, what are we expecting growth to be? And there, I mean, against a growth rate of 7% or so that's been estimated, I mean, all this will get revised, but let's say roughly, 
for the year 22-23. Looks as if we are looking at a growth rate next year of about 6.5%. Uh, now this is actually higher than what most of the international agencies are saying. I mean, they're saying something less, 6.1 or something. And I think it's important to realize that uh, the global economy in the year 2023 is expected to slow down before picking up again in 2024. So, you know, in one sense, uh, our growth rate kind of seems to fit into that because again, 7% this year projecting 6.5. But actually, I think it's a little more complicated than that because today, this year, 7% consists of a much faster growth in the first half with a slowing down in the second half. I think if you look at the aggregate numbers, it looks as if the CSO estimate of 7%, given the very rapid growth in the first half, implies that in the second half, the growth rate will be only about 5%. So we're going to slip into the next year with an underlying momentum of around 5%. And what the budget is projecting is that we will somehow increase that to 6.5%. Although the fiscal deficit is not going to be more expansionary, it's actually going to be more contractionary. So the real question is, uh, where is that impetus going to come from? And clearly the hope has to be that that will come from a revival in private investment, where the performance has been a weak spot for the last several years, perhaps understandable because of the pandemic. So the real question is, is the private sector ready to get back into investment mode or not? And that's clearly an issue that we have to look out for. I guess one takeaway, you know, in the medium term, uh, to achieve the fiscal correction we want, we will have to have an increase in tax revenues as a ratio of GDP. And frankly, that has to come from reform in the GST. But unfortunately, that GST reform is not something we expect to get out of the budget now. It has to come out of the GST Council. I would have been happy if, uh, just as she's saying something about the future that doesn't actually bind the government, but sort of creates an expectation, I would have been happier if we had got a clear sense that as far as GST is concerned, this is what the government wants to do. Because to my mind, that's a very critical area. Uh, of tax reforms, which needs to be taken up on a priority basis. Do you think 6.5% is ambitious or is it something which can be attained? No, I would say it's ambitious, but let's face it, uh, we are facing an uncertain world. Uh, now, when you're facing an uncertain world, there are two approaches you can adopt. One is you can adopt the worst possible outcome approach, because then you have a high certainty of meeting it. The other is that, you know, you hope for the best and a and prepare for the worst. Mm. And I think this is more a kind of hoping for the best. Mm. 6.5 is not an easy target mm. when you're sliding into the year at a lower momentum. Mm. It's not an impossible target because, mm. you know, uh, as you say, we don't quite know what's going to happen in the war. Mm. Uh, whether the war is satisfactorily resolved or comes to a stalemate mm. is the real issue. And, you know, world, uh, world project projections have been very uh, uncertain uh, for the past six months. Yes. I mean, one moment, yes. everybody thinks there's a recession, then they think maybe not so much. So I think there's high uncertainty. Uh, so there's not much to be gained by trying to make something more precise. It's better, in my view, to hope for the best and prepare for the worst. All right. And preparing All right. for the worst really means that, you know, uh, don't be too surprised if you don't get to 6.5. But, you know, if you get 6, that would be pretty good in my view. Sir, thank you so much for your time. Mr. Aluwalia is often referred to as the father of the M document, a blueprint of the reforms agenda authored by him when he was in the VP Singh PMO. In his conversation with Arup, Mr. Aluwalia gives credit to the FM on showing intent on fiscal consolidation. On growth, he believes... The target for FY24 is ambitious, but not impossible. And the reforms man points out that the budget should have spelled out the government's future reform plan for GST. Through these conversations, the consensus seems to be that the budget is not populist. But it has given out quite a bit to various segments, including the industry and the middle class. 
that's all we have for you in budget with bs it's been a wonderful experience and thanks for watching goodbye and see you soon If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.